Well, first, can you hear me? Good, good. Okay. First of all, many, many thanks for the invitation to come here and present to the Summer Institute. I had the good fortune to be involved in the first three Summer Institutes, and uh, this is, I see this is Summer Institute number 15. So it's quite an amazing thing, and I've actually had the great pleasure over the years meeting people who've been on the Summer Institute and have done very well, and are now leaders in the profession. So it's a great thing, that to, pleasure to be here. Um, and I also congratulate once again ABC on their 20th anniversary. So that's very good, excellent. Now, what I'm going to talk about essentially are, are three things. I'm going to talk about simplicity. I'm going to talk about why we get rejected, or why our ideas get rejected. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about my own personal journey with heuristics. So it'll be a little bit of a nostalgic for me trip down memory lane as I talk about heuristics as I, as I, as I got involved in it over the years. Um, so, so I call this Why Simple Solutions Aren't, some reflections on heuristic decision making. And the first thing and question I'm going to ask myself is what's a heuristic? Now, I feel a, 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 this is like bringing coals to Newcastle, come to ABC and say what's a heuristic, but anyway I'll give you my, my working definition is a decision rule or mechanism that allows the organism to take an action without recourse to extensive computation of all relevant information. Now, that's my sort of uh, rough summary of a heuristic. And basically, heuristics can vary on how much relevant information they use. So we're really talking about the use of mechanisms that don't can't, can't use all the information but, uh, but are used. Now, when and why are heuristics effective and or ineffective? And I'm going to repeat things that have already come up in, in some of the speeches already. Basically, I'm going to argue that in brief, heuristics are effective when their characteristics match those of a task which they are confronted. Now that sounds like, uh, well, I, my, I, when I was in high school, I used to write these great essays. My essays were great. <laughs> and my teacher used to write on it, basically, BGO. And I discovered after what he meant by BGO was blinding glimpse of the obvious. <laughs> so, so, so that was my, my so I didn't, I, I got out of the essay writing business in high school. Um, anyway, so this, this might be a BGO. Secondly, the implication is that the study of heuristics should really be a study of task environments because this is where things start. So basically, and this is echoed by many other speak speakers already, but I just want to give it, as I, I endorse this position that's taken, I know, by people here. Now, oops, it's usual to distinguish between tasks which I call discrete or tasks which I call continuous. And I want to, want to point, the point I'm going to make is that a lot of the decisions we make, a lot of the judgments we make, are made in a continuous environment. Uh, and what, is the, what are the features of a, I'll give you an example of a continuous decision by choice. Let's imagine you don't want to listen to my talk anymore. Yes, okay. So you get up and you walk out of the room. Now, do you plan the path you're going to take as you walk out of the room? Or do you, before you go, or do you actually do it on the fly as you go along? I would argue what you do is you stand up, point yourself in a certain direction, head out towards that way, and adjust your path as you, as you go across, out of the room. So your, your decision-making process is really one of adapting continuously to the environment. So a lot, of the, a lot of the decisions and actions we take are, in fact, I would argue, are continuous in nature. So the continuous tasks, would be, I would say many, if not most, human judgment tasks are continuous. For example, physical movements I just talked about. Social interactions. When you go and interact somebody with interact with somebody socially, do you plan every part of the every part of the action out? No. You start off. You start off saying one thing, move around, keep going. So basically, we're living in a world very often where we have short-term actions with low commitment and presence of corrective feedback. Uh, unfortunately, that's not all the kinds of decisions we take. We also have to take. The decisions in discrete environments. But I, I want to, one point I want to make, and this, I made this point actually um, sometime, eight, 1981, I hated to say, see that one. Remember 1981? Never mind. Okay. Uh, basically, I made this point a long time ago, and even I am amazed that it comes back again now. So what I want to try to make is that a lot of the judgments we make are actually heuristic in nature because of the continuous environment in which we live. 
Uh, and basically, that's a lot of. If you looked at all the decisions you did, took today, probably I would I would argue that most of the decisions you took today were continuous rather than discrete. And I think it's an important notion because when we take discrete judgments and decisions, we carry over our habits which we've got from continuous judgments and decisions. And so that's the distinction which I tried to make a few years ago, but I haven't developed it sufficiently. So in this talk, however, I will live in the world of discrete judgments and choices, because that's what we've been talking about. And basically, I'll concentrate on this, and I will argue that people basically need to do two things in, 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 in discrete judgments. One is, my, co my late colleague, uh, lamented colleague Hilly Einhorn, wrote this great paper just before he died, calling about accepting error in decision making in order to reduce error. And the idea here is, if you want to take this decision making, discrete decision making heuristic seriously, you're going to make errors. But if you want to, you're, so what you have got to do is accept error to make less error. And we're living in an uncertain environment, so no, no decision rule we use will actually be error-free. We may struggle to be error-free, but basically if you want to reduce your errors to a minimum, you have to accept error. An example of that would be the phenomenon of probability maximizing versus probability matching. We all know that this is the old story of probability matching. People don't want to basically maximize all the time. They're always trying to predict the error. And that's a, that's a real problem in, 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 in accepting to use heuristics. Um, now, we need to have, the other point I'm going to make is, I'm going to use the word need in a different sense, this sense, but we need to have a strong theoretical justification to accept an empirical generalization. I'm going to argue that most people need some strong reasons before they decide to change it. So I will go back and come back lately about the second need shortly. Okay, now, one of the problems we have, I think, is in, in, in getting our ideas across, is that people resist simple solutions to complex problems. There's a sign of a notion of basically, people believe that complex systems or problems require complex problems, solutions rather. You have a complex problem like unemployment. And someone comes along with a simple solution, what's the first reaction? How do you get rid of it? You say, oh, that's just much not, it's complex. You can't, you can't solve it as a simple solution. So basically, we have a strong bias against simple solutions by, based on the fact that we want to, see, we want to match complexity with, simplicity, with complexity. Second point is, new ideas are hard to accept. My friend, Spiros Makridakis, who will, I'll introduce to you later on in the talk, once said to me that, he, 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 was, he, was, he, was, he was philosophizing on why people had to die. And he came up with a wonderful, interesting, creative idea. He said, basically, people have to die because basically that's the only way ideas can, can, can evolve. And I turned around and I looked around and I saw that actually several great people in the literature had said that. Um, Enrico Fermi, the, the, the physicist, said basically, once asked, how do you get your, your ideas accepted? And he said, go to a lot of funerals. <laughs> and so the notion there is, you know, that basically most of us resist new ideas, and therefore perhaps the only way new generations can move forward in ideas is actually for us, people like myself, to get out of the way. So basically new ideas are hard to accept. And we got to think about, actually, that leads to an issue of rather than having people like myself get out of the way, can we think of ways in helping people to accept new ideas? We'll come back and we'll talk about that at the end of, I hope we have some discussion on that at the end of the talk. Um, another point is it can be difficult to know whether, ah, it can be difficult to know whether simple methods will work. If I, if I actually come along with a solution to a problem and say to you, this is the solution, it's a simple solution, it may be difficult for you to evaluate that. Now, I once got some very big insight into that issue. I had the uh, pleasure at once to be involved in a seminar with a man called Edward de Bono, who used to be a great creativity guru. I said, have people heard of Edward de Bono? He was a lateral thinking guy. He's actually written the same book 5,000 times, but never mind. <laughs> anyway, he, he came up with, I, he, giving all these cute examples in, in this lecture on how to be more creative and everything, and everyone was in awe of his great skills. And I said to him afterwards at the break, I said, you know, why you come, why, how come you use such Mickey Mouse problems for, to illustrate your creative process? And he said, well, you know, it's the following reason. Basically, people understand the causal structure of the Mickey Mouse problems. So if I present a solution, they will understand it's a solution. If I give them problems that are complex, such as how do you get rid of unemployment, 
they won't be able to understand the problem, in which case they can't see what the solution would be. So the notion he had there, which I thought was kind of interesting, was basically the notion that it can be difficult to know whether simple wet methods will work because we don't have the causal brain work to be able to understand that the new problems, we, the new solutions we suggested are going to work. So I actually, th I actually thought that the Bono's insight into that was, was, was quite interesting and, and helpful. Okay, what I'm going to do is um, go through four case studies of, of these points. Case study number one will be what I call clinical versus statistical prediction. Case study number two will be simple models and time series analysis. Case study number three will be optimal versus equal weighting. I will put, put a plug in for equal weighting. I'll come back and explain why I plug for equal weighting by the end of the, the talk. And basically, I'm going to talk about the theory behind take the best. As a, as a very loose um, expression when I say the theory behind take the best. But we'll kind of get into that. Don't worry, it's not going to be bad. <laughs> um, OK, four case studies. Clinical versus statistical prediction. Uh, I might add to say that, with the exception of the first one, I've been personally involved in the three others, so it was part of the trip down memory lane for me. Clinical versus statistical prediction. I think this is actually one of the most fascinating results since World War II. In 1954, Paul Neal, who was both a psychiatrist and a statistician, published a very interesting book on prediction by, by, by clinicians. And he reviewed 20 empirical studies which showed the superiority of statistical over clinical judgment. Now, by clinical judgment, I mean basically imagine you're a patient, you come in to see me, the doctor, I examine you, and at the end I say, Psych psychotic. Or I saw, you know, not, not psychotic. That's clinical judgment. And we're all used to clinical judgment of that kind. By statistical judgment, I mean basically the patient doesn't come in to see the doctor, but there's a file of, med of, of data and basically, we develop a regression model and we predict. We use the regression model to predict. Now, when Neil did, his, did this, this study, basically the th thought was he will compare clinical judgment against statistical prediction. And what we'll, we'll find is that the clinical, the statistical, sorry, the statistical judgment will be a flaw and we'll see how much better people are at predicting than, than statistics. Well, it turned out, unfortunately, the floor was a ceiling. Because basically, in none of his studies was statistical prediction outdone by clinical prediction. So basically, he came across this result that basically statistics beat na now. You might imagine that in an area like clinical psychology, where you need the best predictions you can get, if you can cheaply run studies by using statistics, everyone will accept and think that's great. What happened? No. Outrage. Outrage. Basically, people argued that it was a nomothetics case as opposed to the ideographic, proper ideographic perspectives. There's a man called Holt who wrote actually tons and tons of articles about it, actually made Holt's career about why Mule was wrong. And he said actually what Mule was doing was totally irrelevant. Uh, and so basically this, this wonderful result that Paul Mule had, which was you could replace humans in the prediction thing by statistical models, has not succeeded in that particular area. Now, since 1954, what's happened? You say that's a long time ago. Well, there was a very interesting uh, meta-analysis done in the year 2000 by Grove et al. And I quote what they said on their meta-analysis. We identified no systematic exceptions to the general superiority of mechanical prediction. It holds in general medicine, in mental health, in personality, and in education and training settings. It holds for medically trained judges, and for psychologists, it holds for inexperienced and seasoned judges. So basically, the, 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 the evidence is overwhelming that basically in lots of those kinds of situations, on average, I accept error to make less error. On average, accepting error to make less error, we would be better off if we used statistical prediction instead of clinical judgment. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you know, this hasn't ha happened in that way. Now, there are a number of actually further applications which are interesting. Um, Hilly Einhorn did a very interesting study called Ex Expert Measurement and Mechanical Combination. Do people know this study? No. <laughs> Well, what he, Einhorn did was a very interesting study. He looked at, he got some data, he got a data set on cancer patients. 
And he found that basically what, what happened was, for a particular cancer disease, what happened was that they had the, the, the data cassette consisted of uh, readings of, the, of, of a biopsy slide on the cancer patients. So a biopsy slide is a horrible thing like that. It's kind of all kind of messy. It's how the readings of what were all the characteristics of the biopsy slides. And then besides that, there was a length of time the patient survived from the moment that the biopsy slide was taken to the, to the death of the patient. And the physicians who happened to be the world's experts in that particular disease made predictions from the biopsy slides to how long the patients would live. And what turned out, the correlation was as close to zero as you can get. These, they, and they were very angry about this. They really were. They tried to hide the data. Anyway, Tilly Einhorn said, well, you know, this is, a, this, is a, this is a problem here, but we can actually do something about it. Instead of throwing this stuff out and forgetting about the study, let's look and see what are the parts of the decision that the physicians do well or can do, and what are the parts the physicians do badly? Well, what's quite clear is you can't actually get a machine to read the biopsy slides. So you need clinical judgment to, to create the data set, the X's. But what you don't need the people for is to make the aggregation. So what he suggested was that we, there should be a man-machine combination whereby the, the men, or the doctors in this case, did the measurement of active measuring instruments to try and actually measure what was in the biopsy slides, and basically then you turned over the, the aggregation to, to, to the machine. Uh, and I thought that was a great idea because basically it says, look, everyone has plays a role and that works very well. In fact, nowadays there's actually an application of that. Can anyone think of a daily application of that? A wide, worldwide, which actually works very well? Come on. Well, I'll give you an example. When you go to the supermarket, you buy a whole bunch of stuff, you throw it into a basket, you come up to the, to the checkout counter, and what happens? There's a machine actually reads what the prices are, right? And who does the, who, who adds up the, the bill? Do you do it? The machine. The machine does it. Does the clerk do it? No, the machine does it. So we trust the machine, okay? Uh, and I'm trying to make the point is that there are lots of situations where I think we could actually follow that kind of idea and use machines to aggregate the information where humans are giving the inputs in other kinds of ways. So basically, I, I was a very nice paper, Einhorn, which I recommend, Expert Measurement and Mechanical Combination. Um, yeah, there was another, another case which actually uh, is, I was once involved with called, called the case of the admissions director. Now, this is going to go off record. So nobody heard this story, okay? Um, but w when I was at the University of Chicago, um, actually I had an administer position for, at the time Gert was there, I had an administer position, and we had a problem of admissions because we had a lot of people wanting to come to the university, get into it. And we had an admissions director who was a most I should put it, uh, enthusiastic and conscientious guy. And he read all the applications. And I can tell you, reading applications entrance to graduate school is a real pain. And you may have written some, but I can tell you reading is worse. Uh, and uh, Anyway, so he used to read all these applications. And I, I said applications, he was talking about, we're talking about reading 2,000 applications. Applications and then letters. Oh boy, letters, they're, they're, they're pretty awful too. So basically, letters, applications, essays on why I want to be the greatest person to save the world, et cetera, et cetera. And so we said to them, Don, look, you, know, we, you could use your time much better. Instead of reading all these applications, why don't you have a little model? And I have my, my colleague, Josh Clayman, uh, actually was on a committee with a bunch of, us, of us economists, and, it, and he convinced the economists what we needed was a regression model. And he, they were convinced. I was amazed. Okay, they were convinced. We should have a regression model, and we should make our applications largely by the regression model. But this is really difficult to sell to, this, to the admissions director, because he liked to say, I read all the applications. Why? I don't know. But anyway. So basically, we said, okay, 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 Don. What we'll do is, we'll take the top 10%, you'll admit whatever happens, just, just, just admit the top 10%, and actually just get rid of the bottom 10% and only make your decisions about the middle 80%. And that at least gets rid of 20% of your, of your reading. And that, that would be a considerable saving and use that reading for other, other activities. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't see the argument. 
Uh, but it's an interesting question because we should ask ourselves, how come we were not able to sell that? Because it would have been a, a, a something that would have helped I immensely. So that was the case of the emissions director. Okay, on, on the other hand, on the other hand, one application where it does work, where a credit, a credit risk is a, is, a big, is a big success, and that's where actually the applications are, do, are done well. Now, the next, that was, so that's one case study. Basically, the, my argument here is we have, there's lots of applications in the world where we, we can use simple mechanical methods to predict better, and we should, we should actually not be having humans adding things up in, the, in their heads, but we should have people, the machines, do it instead. Now, I would like to talk about simple models and time series. How many people here are involved in time series data? Oh, well, we've got a couple. That's good. Okay, well, that means, good, I can see what I want, right? No. Okay, there's a huge need to forecast time series in industry. Basically, in, uh, everything of every company generating data, sales data, order data, so on, so on. There's a lot, a lot of data around there, economic data, need time series industry. And basically, the development of statistical time series models was very, very strong in the 1960s and 1970s, and in 1976, Box and Jenkins published a very famous book on how to, how to forecast using time series. Now, the trouble was the following. Do they work? And compared to what? Now, my friend Spiros Makoudakis, the great philosopher I just referred to, uh, happened to be working with me at, the same, at that time in the, in, the, in the 70s at INSEAD. We were colleagues together. And he and uh, another person called Michel Ibon decided to do a study of time series uh, predictions. And basically, they organized a competition. Uh, and this competition reminds me a bit of, uh, of your sm smart book, OK? The competition basically involved the out-of-sample forecasting performance of 22 methods on 111 time series. Now, remember, this is 1979. We don't have the data analysis capacities you have now. So that was a quite a big deal. But basically, they could take 111 time series use, look at 22 different methods, and do organize a forecasting competition amongst these things. So they, they, they started out saying, well, presumably, Box Jenkins will now be, 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 be valid verified. And what they found, however, that was a big surprise. The best results were achieved by a simple exponential smoothing model after adjusting for seasonality. Exponential smoothing is a very simple model. It's like a one-parameter model with an adjustment for seasonality. And that turned out to be the quote-unquote best time series model. Now, they were lucky in a sense because they were invited to present this information, this, this paper at the, at the Royal Statistical Society in London. And so they went to London and presented their paper. And well, actually, they were very badly received. <laughs> if you can read British English, which isn't always written the way it's, it's actually meaning, and read the comments made on, on the papers, a lot of the comments they got in the paper were saying basically, well, you're not proper statisticians, you don't know how to use the methods properly. Uh, you're making mistakes. There's all kinds of things. And they got a very rude reception. They got their paper published, but they got a very rude reception. So the question is, what will you do about it? Well, for Spiros is actually a very clever guy. And he said, well, let's think about what we can do. Perhaps what we should do is run some more competitions. And since they think that basically I can't, I'm not sufficiently sophisticated to run the models, we'll let the experts in the models run them. So basically, let's say Kyung is an expert in, in linear regression, we'll let him run the linear regression models and I won't do it. So they run basically a number, a, a second competition called the M competition where they got 1,001 series where experts were invited to manage their models. So basically this was another competition, 1,001. Why 1,001? Arabian Nights. <laughs> OK. That was just a little joke between us, OK? Arabian Nights. So 101 time series where experts were invited to manage their models. And what happened there? Same thing. Basically, the models were, were, were not as good as the simple models. Simple models did very well. So after that, some of the experts complained. said, well, you know, in forecasting in the real world, we don't just analyze the data. We also understand contextual effects, you know, whether it's winter, whether it's summer, whether there's just been a depression, and so on and things. So let's, let's, why can't you let us put in some contextual information and, and, and help the model, like subjective adjustments? So in the next M competition, which was in 1993, experts were given access to the contextual data. And what happened? <laughs> Nothing. 
contextual data didn't help. So once again, the simple models came, came through. Finally, in M, the M3 competition, and this is the M3 is the last one, don't worry, in 2000, 3003 series from different areas with different forecast horizons, and basically were there. He found the same kind of results, and actually sam sam summarizing his results, he said basically, uh, Statistically complex, sophisticated or complex models do not necessarily provide more accurate forecasts than simpler ones. The relative ranking of the performance of various methods varies according to the accuracy measure used. The accuracy when various methods are combined outperforms on average the individual methods being combined and does very well in comparison to the other methods. The accuracy of the various methods depends on the length of the forecast horizon involved. So they got an actually a very good set of results, including the notion of combining results into averaging situations too. So it was that, but that was a very good set of studies. Now, we should ask the following question. What is the impact of this study? Well, let's see. The following, the findings have been it's actually been exploited by quite a number of practitioners. Basically, people who actually have money on the end, on the, on the end of the table basically have exploited it quite well. What about theoretical statisticians? No, that's right, ignored by theoretical statisticians. So basically, so the people who, who actually make some money can use it and are doing money very well, but the theoretical statisticians are still wondering what to do next. So anyway, that's, that's a, one of the questions we should ask ourselves is how we could actually persuade them eventually to follow Spiros' work. Um, okay, optimal versus equal weighting. This is the third thing I'm going to talk about. Now, we're all brought up in the OLS religion. OLS meaning ordinary least squares. Basically, x prime x inverse x prime y. Okay, remember that? X prime x inverse x prime y? If you don't remember that, you've lost your econometrics. <laughs> so we're all brought up to believe that is the way to go. Now, in 1972 or so, 72, 73, basically Robin Dawes conducted what I might call an outlandish experiment. He called one day, his, his, his research assistant, Bernard Corrigan, didn't have much to do, so Robin said, well, I've got an interesting experiment we could run. You see this data here. I want you to do two things. I want you to take this data, run a regression model, keep an out of out of, out of, out of sample uh, out of prediction out of out of you know, prediction sample, and see how well the regression model predicts the data. At the same time, I also want you to run another model, and this other model basically will have the following current characteristics: the, the x variables must all be pointed in the right direction. Uh, as y. Okay, pointed in the right direction, meaning basically if x is going to go up, y is going to go up. But actually for the regression weights, what I want you to do is to take a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, and basically randomly assign weights to the different variables. And basically he ran the experiment, basically, and what happened was Corrigan, when he ran the experiment, came back surprised because in the data set he had, the random model outpredicted the regression model. Now, I have talked, I, t I teach in an economics department. I've explained this story several times in my classes, and the students think this guy is totally crazy. <laughs> because the old, old, old ordinary least squares belief is so strong, it's very difficult to get over it. So what I tell the students is to go out and run and run some of it yourself, but they never do. So but basically, I think it's a really important point. Now, this is uh, this was an uh, optimal of equal weighting. So the equal weighting, now why, why equal weighting? Because basically, if you take, if you take, the, if, if the regression weights are randomly sampled between zero and one on a uniform distribution, on average, they will be equal. So you could actually think about equal weighting as well. Now, the results were really not believed. Dawes had problems getting his work published. He, when he presented his work at some of the professional meetings, people said it was impossible, and so on and so forth. But so if you get impossible results, you must try and replicate, and people did after go home and replicate and find they could work. Now, why does equal weighting work? Equal weighting meaning in the sense that I'm going to not predict using regression weights. I'm going to actually predict, basically, by lining up the variables in the right direction and adding basically across or equal weighting them. Why don't they work? Well, Dawes and Corrigan 
came up with four reasons why equal weighting might work well. One, having the appropriate variables in the function is more important than the precise form of the function. Okay, so in other words, the real key is, do you have the right variables? The second idea they came up was that it would work in cases where each predictor, predictor has a conditionally monotone relationship with the criterion. So in other words, they root out certain kinds of interactions. A third type was basically there could be error in measurement. If there's error in measurement, that could make the, the estimation less, less successful. And fourth, deviations from optimality may not be important. That's sometimes called the um, flat maximum problem. Now it turns out flat maxima exist everywhere. I'll give you an example of one I discovered recently. Think of uh, the regression to the mean problem. Think of ignoring base rates. Okay? Think of two people. One person is personally Mr. Mr. Bayesian or Miss Bayesian and basically when he, get, he or she gets the problem puts in the base rate and up, 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 upgrade, uh, uh, and uh, combines the base rate with the information and actually makes correct regression judgments. The other person is mis mismatching. Mismatching just forgets about the, about the base rate and matches representatively the outcomes with uh, predictions with, with the inputs. Okay? So forget a base rate. Now, Let's think about this in a learning environment. What is the information people are going to see after they made predictions? Well, they make predictions. This person makes the Bayesian prediction. This person makes the matching prediction. And you can ask yourself the question, what is the feedback they're going to get? How does it differ, the feedback for the matching people and the, and, 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 and the regression people? What do you think? Well, it turns out if you correlate the errors that would be observed by the matching person and the regression and the Bayesian person, the errors are very highly correlated. And it's, it's quite clear that unless you're dealing with the extremes of the distribution, it doesn't make much difference. And so in terms of what it suggests is that basically because there is a flat maximum, people are not able to learn that kind of thing very easily because the data is not available, it's not coming to them. Now that's not a published result, that's just something I, I worked out uh, a couple months ago. Now, it turned out in 19, ah, 1973, remember 1973? <laughs> I spent, uh, as after I got my PhD, I spent a very nice three months at, at the University of Chicago working with Hilly Einhorn, and when I got into the office the, the first day there, he said, we have this results by Dawes. And he showed me the working paper from Dawes and Corrigan. He said, we don't know why it happens. Can you work on it? So basically, you know, after 20 kilos less, uh, a bad summer, we actually came up with a paper, which I don't like very much nowadays, but it came up with some insights, and basically came up one insight, basically about why equal weights works well, and also, uh, which is the following. If you actually look at why equal weights works, it works when basically you've got a fairly low R squared, and there is intercorrelation amongst the X variables. That's the best way for equal weights to work. And what does equal weights do? Well, the worst thing that can happen in a regression situation is that you estimate the sizes of the coefficients incorrectly, the ratio of the two coefficients incorrectly. I make one bigger than the other as opposed to this way around, okay? If you, if you actually assign equal weights to each of the coefficients, what happens? Well, basically, you can't inverse the, the weights. And so that's one of the reasons why equal weights actually works well, because it, could, it avoids that kind of error. You're actually putting in, the, in a constraint. So that was, that was one insight that we got out of that model, and the other thing, oh, we'll talk a bit more about it. But basically, uh, equal weighting actually quite well. And I thought at that point, this is great. Equal weighting works. We've got this great thing. We have this theoretical paper. The rest of the world will come and beat, beat itself to the door here and will be famous and etc. Okay, no. What's been the follow-up? Well, basically, if you look in psychology, there is a recognition of equal weighting in psychometrics. Uh, quite a lot of uh, in, in psychometrics creating scales and so on and so on, equal weighting. But actually, there's also a tradition that goes back to the 30s uh, us using that there. So the, the Dawes' work is actually quoted in the psychometric te textbooks. If you go to the economics, there's not even a mention 
I have talked to several leading econometricians about this, and they just think I'm totally nuts. I mean, I, I, I've not succeeded yet in actually making any of them believe me that this happens, uh, and, or even doing an experiment. But basically, in economics, not even a mention in textbooks and, and surveys, including a very influential survey of, of, of methods. So I think that's fine. So, and social sciences, however, I think there is some sense of equal weights being accepted because of things like the wisdom of the crowds. The wisdom of the crowds is essentially the notion of averaging. Equal weights is a, is a sense of averaging. And I think in the social sciences, thanks to the, the wisdom of crowds kind of literature, there is some kind of method. Social sciences, excluding economics, it actually works quite well. So I think there is some follow-up in that respect. I may be stretching a bit when I say wisdom of crowds. Now, uh, this is now the third, hang on, I'm on my fourth one? I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. Okay, simplifying the optimal. Okay, let's think of a general optimal formula, which you're all familiar with. It's utility of y is equal to the sum of the weighted sum of the utility of the x's. So general kind of multi-attribute utility function kind of thing. And ask yourself the question, uh, basically, if people choose according, if people can't necessarily choose according to that. We know we follow a bounded rationality. People can't choose according to that. What happens if people actually start to use other methods for making choices? How close do they come to, you, to the, using the optimal formula or the outcomes? Of the so, in other words, when can you ignore information and yet still make good decisions using heuristics? Now, the two earliest people, people who talked about that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one is a person called Thorngate in 1980. He did a nice paper showing basically a whole bunch of problems uh, of, of this kind of, of that type and showing if you actually ignored probabilities, what would happen, if you went for minimax, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a nice paper by Thorngate in 1980. Similarly, Payne, Betzman, and Johnson in 1993 came up with a nice book, and they came up with an effort accuracy trade-off idea, basically that they did a whole bunch of interesting simulations, and, and they showed essentially that sometimes you didn't need to have everything in the formula. But this was not all. In 1996, now, a shocking result happened. In 1996, I was in Chicago, I was actually in the dean's office, that was when we were doing all this uh, stuff with admissions, and they happened to have the JDM meeting in Chicago that year. So I went down to, the, I said, oh, well, this is great, the JDM meeting, I can escape my, my administrative duties and go down to the JDM meeting. I went down to the JDM meeting, and who was speaking but one Gert Gigerenzer. And Gert Gigerenzer actually showed me, showed something at that meeting, which I found at the time, remember I'm very keen on equal weights. I mean, I'm now invested in equal weights because this is my thing. Okay, you will find it. It's my baby, so not, not just my baby, but you know, a really, really important thing. I, I suddenly, Gert Gigerenzer put up a graph on the screen. Now, I'm not sure. I'm sure, pretty sure the graph I'm going to show you is not the graph, but it's very similar to the graph. He showed me this. Wow. Basically, this was a kind of a simulation. This actually comes from the 1996 Gigerenza and uh, Goldstein paper. And basically, this is prediction, the proportion of correct responses in a simulation. Basically, this is the number of objects recognized. Forget about it, that doesn't matter. This is the, the regressions results. This is, this, is this is take the best results. And here's weighted linear, you know, weighted linear model, way down here. We were wiped out. We were wiped out by take the best. I won't cry yet, don't worry. But basically, I was shocked, so I went back to the dean's office. Uh, and um, so, so I had to think about this. You know, there's, there's a real shocking result here. The Gertz model, somehow or other, my, my unit weighting model basically takes account of all the information, except it just gives equal weights to the things, and Gertz model, I don't know what it, the hell it does, but anyway, it, it manages to predict better than me. I don't like that. Uh, and so I, I empathize with people who, uh, anyway. <laughs> so, I said, uh, then, then another thing happened was in 99, Gerd organized something called the Dalham Conference, which was a very good uh, meeting where we had together, and then in 2001 was the first summer school. And so in 2001, I was in the South Summer School. I, these people from ABC were up telling me how it could take the best was. 
and I was I was my kid, so they were sitting in the room trying to think about as I was there and in, 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 in listening to all these lectures, how can I show them that take the best isn't the best? And so basically, let's try and analyze it and try and see what, what's going on in this situation. So let me see what I show you actually what turned out to be a, a research program which I embarked on with Natalia Karolaya. Um, okay. Okay, many judgment and decision-making tasks involve selecting one of two options based on a series of binary cues. Now, I will simplify things by only talking about take the best, which is the choice between two. In fact, we've actually generalized the choice, one a choice amongst many, okay, which we call DEBA, for other reasons I'll explain later. Okay, many judgments are following binary cues. So you have A, characterized by A1, A2, A3, B, characterized by, by uh, its things, and basically, the question is the following, well, how is it going to work? Well, there are two rules. Now, we, I know you've heard these today 25,000 times, but let me repeat them again. A lexicographic rule, take the best, is basically order the cues according to their validities, which I, I call called conditional probabilities of indicating the correct option. It's one way of describing the validities. No, Laura? Conditioning that discrimination, sorry. Yeah, well, well, well how important they are. <laughs> Okay, correlations, well, we can argue with that. But anyway, order the cues according to, the, according to their validities. Basically, does the first cue discriminate between two options? If yes, choose the appropriate option. If no, consider the next cue. Consider cues sequentially until you find one that can discriminate between the options. If no, in the such cue, choose at random. We all know so that's take the best, right? Equal weighting, my friend, is basically assume all cues are equally important. Sum the cues for each option and choose the option with the largest sum. It's very easy. We, we looked at that in several talks ago today. If sums are equal, choose at random. Now, the question is the following. This, this was now, now I'll give you the, the insight. Uh, having said that, I let myself up for a big question, right? How will take the best and equal weight models perform in error-free theoretical environments. So instead of talking about variance and bias and other kinds of things, let's just say, let's take an error-free theoretical environment and see how well do these models predict. And basically, in the scenario here is to imagine that environments are governed by linear rules of the form y is equal to beta sub the x's, okay, where there's no error. I don't have any error here, okay? It's just basically a theoretical the environment. And basically, where well, y is the dependent variable, the betas are the weighting function parameters, and the xi can take values of only 0 and 1, and we assume that the sum of the weights is equal to 1. But, but, but it has no noise. So I want to, I want to the, this, is, this is what we call the can opener approach in economics. Do you know what that is? But for the, for the, for those who don't know what it is, I'm, I can't help tell it, right? There's three guys on a desert island, deserted, lost. As a physicist, a chemist, and an economist. And they're down to the last can of beans. And this is a problem. The last can of beans. They don't have a can opener. So they look at the, the chemist looks at it and says, you know, this is interesting because if I actually light a fire under the can, I could figure out, given the properties of, of, of the beans, at what point it would explode. And the physicist said, that's very interesting because you give me those properties there, I can calculate the trajectory of the, ban of the, of the can, and the open can, and we can catch the beans as they come out. And they both, so the physicist and the chemist were very happy, they were very clever, they they'd figured it out how to do it, and they looked at the economist and said, well, what's your contribution? He said, well, assume there's a can opener. <laughs> so. <laughs> So there's different, different, different theoretical takes on, on so this. I'm assuming, I, I'm, this is a can opener approach. I'm assuming a theoretically clean environment. Okay, now in this exactly clean environment, now it can be shown that basically the relevant characteristics are one, the type of weighting function, i.e. the distribution of the betas, the characteristics of choice sets. I didn't hear so much talk about that today. In other words, dominance pairings, repeats, presence, absence of specific profiles. And I'll explain to you why that's important shortly. Okay, um, types of weighting functions. Basically, there's two types of weighting functions we talk about in, in the literature. One is what we call non-compensatory, which we, we've heard about today quite a bit. And basically the idea there is that weights are ordered from largest to smallest. Each weight is larger than the sum of all the weights that are smaller than it. 
Okay, and then that's so that's 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 English, and then you've got the Greek afterwards. It explains it. Now, what are compensatory functions or all, all other ones? Okay, so two types of functions: non-compensatory and compensatory. Now, we know as we've met today, the results are basically um, intuitively you can look at it like this. Here's a case where you've got essentially four Qs. You've got this one here. This blue is a non-compensatory. 55 is bigger than 35, and 35 is bigger than some of the rest. 45 has for non -com for the compensatory. 45 is less than the sum of the rest. It's bigger than 0.3. It's bigger than this. But basically, this is a compensatory. So basically, we have a compensatory and non-compensatory. Now, why is that important? Basically, a big distinction. Okay. TTB, take the best, is optimal in this linear world if the weighting function is non-compensatory. That's the result that uh, Laura and, uh, and Hofrager had in two, two nice time papers. And intuition is, for example, in the simple case of three variables, if the first Q has more than 50% of the weights, the information in the remaining Qs is irrelevant in the, with a 0, 1 independent variable. Okay, that's sort of intuitive. Now, the question is, what can we say about compensatory functions? Well, I'm, I actually gave a, yesterday the introductions. I made the point, and it's a very serious point. My original training was in accounting, so I count things. And so what I decided to do was an accounting analysis, and I'll show you the results of my accounting analysis. Let's take the case of the three Qs, and basically ask yourself. What would be the choices between any options of three Qs? So for example, you've got here Qs x1, x2, x3. The Qs can take the value 0 or 1. So basically, there are eight different possible sets of values. You can see 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, I can't see there. OK. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, et cetera, et cetera, OK? And the question you can ask yourself is, what happens when you pair these things up one against each other? And remember, we're talking about a world without noise and, 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 and thing, OK? Now, one way of doing that is to calculate with what I call difference vectors. So let's consider what happens when each profile is paired once with each of the others, i.e. the quotation consists of the eight distinct profiles. And to do this, consider what I call the difference vector. So the difference vector would be the vector of differences between 1, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 0. It would be 0, 0, 1, for example. OK, you got it? See, it helps to be an accountant. Okay, this is the difference vectors for three Qs. Now, what's kind of interesting here is, this is, if, imagine a population where there's one of each type, and we're going to pair everyone and find out the different kinds of choices. So this gives you the whole population of choices. Okay, it doesn't say how many we had of each type, but so what we get here, for example, is A against B is 0, 0, 1, because A is 1, 1, 1, B is 1, 1, 0, and the difference is 0, 0, 1, right? So I, when I did that, laid that table out, what was the first, what's the first thing that strikes you about that table? Not enough accountants here. But what strikes you is basically any, any series that basically of non-negative numbers indicates dominance. Remember we met dominance this morning? Any series of Non-zero numbers represents dominance. So basically, A dominates B and C and D and E and F and G and H. H A dominates everything. And what you see is just a hell of a lot of dominance. Okay, and I'm not saying that there is a lot of dominance in the environment, but just theoretically, if we only observe one observation from each of the possible types, we get lots and lots of dominance. So basically, one of the results we get is a lot of dominance. The second thing we know is that we were dealing with a compensatory function. We're dealing with a compensatory function. With a compensatory function, beta 1 is bigger than beta 2 is bigger than beta 3, right? But beta 1 is less than beta 2 plus beta 3. OK? If, 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 it was, if it wasn't, it would be compensatory. So basically, beta 1 has to be bigger than beta 2, has to be bigger than beta 3, and beta 1 has to be bigger than beta 2 than beta 3. So if knowing that, that, that those inequalities, you can actually look at each case and th see about how what's going to what, what's take the best going to do. So, for example, let's take, oops, 
Let's take this case here. Zero, what's going to happen? Zero, no choice. I'm sorry. Zero, no choice. One is going towards B. And minus one. Okay, what's going to be the choice here? C or B? We're going to choose B because basically the weight associated with the second one is bigger than the weight associated with the third one. Okay? So basically, this is just a very simple counting operation where basically you go through and you count and see what can happen. And if you do that, and I'll give you the result in the future, it turns out that take the best is for three Qs is optimal for all cases with except for one. And that one case is this one here, DE. Because here we have one minus one minus one, and basically, as you can see, that's minus one and minus one. The weights are more than 0.5, or less than 0.5 here in a, non -com in a compensatory assumption. So basically, take the best in this theoretical can opener model, actually predicts everything perfectly with one exception. With that, I, I, you know, I almost retired. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so basically using difference vectors to determine pairings that imply basically dominance, a lot of dominance. To take the best is correct for, for compensatory function. Using the facts of beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 3, and beta 1 is less than beta 2 and beta 3. Basically, take the best is incorrect for, for compensatory function, and there's only one case. And basically, for EW, however, is incorrect, incorrect for CF, and basically, if I can get this correct, the results for the three Qs, dominance takes case in 19 pairings out of 28. We talked this morning about the amount of dominance in the environment, so this is just dominance. TD, T to take the best is correct in eight of the additional ones, so take the best gets obviously all the dominance ones correct, plus eight other ones correct. Take the best is one incorrect, the DE pairing. Equal weights gets three correct, Hooray. <laughs> and zero incorrect, and actually gets six times. So you would get, on average, 0.5 of, of six, three. So you can see here, by just looking at this can opener approach and looking at these, this, this simple 3KQ model, basically, why take the best is such a powerful model? Because it's only getting wrong in one case. And so if you're actually going to run a competition between they take the best and equal weights with three Qs, basically take the best is going to win unless you stack it up with DE cases. So if you're really nasty, you can say I can construct a data set in which basically take the best will be beaten by, beaten by EW, or I can construct a data set in which EW is better than, than take the best in this kind of world. Now this is a world without noise, and, and, and it's not, we're assuming somehow that the result is correct. Now, I was very excited about these results, even though they were only on the back of an envelope. And I discussed them with my colleague in Barcelona, Manuel Balsais. And Manuel actually came up with some, what seems the results. So I think dominance is important. So, okay, let me move on. Yeah, sorry. You should also look at, Constantinus has a paper on that on 2013 using the same idea, right? But extending it to more variables. I've also extended to more variables, but my Excel program doesn't like it and uh, kicks me out uh, after certain periods of time. So but basically it gets complicated when you go beyond three variables. And because there are different types you can have, different types of weighting you can have. But Constantinus has a nice paper explaining all that. Now, I spoke to my friend Manel, and Manel said, look, Robin, dominance is important, but there's this concept that Craig Kirkwood and uh, Rakesh Sarin had in the 80s called cumulative dominance. And so all we should look at is not just dominance, we should also look at cumulative dominance. And this morning it was explained to you, but I'll explain it again. If we consider two alternatives, A is equal to 1, 1, 0, and B is to 1, 0, 1, then we have the case A does not dominate B on a Q by Q basis, okay? Because 1 is actually equal to greater than 1. 1 is greater, the second Q is greater than 0, but the third Q is less than 1. So basically, A does not dominate B. But A does dominate B cumulatively. Because basically, 1 is bigger than 1, or equal to greater than 1. 1 plus 1 is bigger than 1 plus 0. And 1 plus 1 plus 0 is bigger than 1 plus 0 plus 1. So that's cumulative dominance. And we saw this morning. Uh, so let me talk a little bit. Why, why, why is that important? Well, it turns out, and this is a, 
more generally, cumulative dominance is present when there is at least one alternative that cumulatively dominates all others in a set of alternatives. Now, why is this important? Well, basically, in this paper, which uh, the lead author was Manuel Bausais, basically showed something which I think is a big result. Now, let me read this so I get it right. Within the classic MOUT framework, multi-attribute utility framework, with binary attributes, that's like a von neumann morgenstern multi attribute utility function, a heuristic like TTBS that selects the cumulatively dominant alternative will optimize. Hence, knowledge of precise Q weights is not necessary. So provided you can order the Q weights, you can actually get the optimal model by using cumulative dominance. So I guess one of the one of the one of the one of the criticisms we had this morning was how would you how would you relate this work to work in economics? What well, would I relate to work in economics? Saying if in your economic model people are supposed to be maximizing expected utility of the firm I talked about here, basically take the best or what we call DBA deterministic expected by uh, external elimination by Aspergs will actually do the trick. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Only among the linear models. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm talking about linear models. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about linear models. That's right. That's important. But basically, it, all linear models. But I'll, I'll, there, is an, there is an extension I can talk about in a moment. So this actually is a kind of an interesting result because if, in fact, your data has a lot of... So we... Sorry. This does not apply just to take the best. It applies to something called DEBA, which is deterministic elimination by aspects, which is the extension of the thing. It applies to any model that is, con is consistent with, 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 um, with, with cumulative dominance. So there's a class of models. It's not just a result of take the best, which is important. And that's why it's an important result. Uh, and was, uh, this is Manel's result. So extension to DEA and other models. Now, it turns out that Constantinus, once again, has done some work where he's tried to look at what happens when the, these variables are, the variables, the, the X variables are binary. He's asked the question, does this generalize to variables when X is continuous? And what happens when you have some kinds of interactions between the variables? And what Constantine has found was that actually it doesn't generalize totally, but it does actually a quite a good job. I mean, that, that, that's a good characterization. Okay, you'll live with that one. Okay. Okay, so basically what I think is kind of interesting is I think now that after being this um, critic or take the best in my early days of trying to defend equal weighting, uh, I now, with the, with the result of cumulative dominance, actually I'm really impressed by what it actually managed to do and, and move forward. And I think one of the things I'd say is that in the 15 years since the summer school has, has existed, we've made some progress. And this is without doing all the bias of error and stuff, which is actually very excellent too, and deals with when you've got error in the system as well. So that was the importance of cumulative dominance. Um, okay. And also, there was a beautiful paper described this morning by Simsek on the 51 natural environments, which I love, which basically shows, basically, if you go out and sample environments, you will find that in those environments, you have a lot of cumulative dominance going on. So it's not the case that cumulative dominance holds in all environments, but it seems to hold in quite a lot of them. And we're, as, as we're in the era of big data, I'm sure more data sets will become available, and people can check it out, and they'll get algorithms to check out how it does. Questions? Oh, we're doing okay, okay. Uh, in addition to this work, I also worked with Natalia Carolaya on trying to look at um, heuristic models within a sort of statistical framework where we had error in the system and continuous variables. And basically, we did a lot of pay work on this. Uh, I think one of the papers was actually given out as, as, a, as a reading in the, in the thing. And basically, kind of got some, so the question we ask ourselves, does heuristic performance depend just on binary variables? The answer is no. At first, I thought it was just because it was binary. That was my first, in, in my first intuitive sort of guess. But no, it doesn't. We have a model called SV, which is not very complicated. It's called single variable. It just says, choose to take the most important variable. And if you're in a certain environment, take the most important variable can help predict other regression models and so on and so forth. We've shown that theoretically with empirical simulations and also empirically. Um, how you characterize choice based on continuous variables, basically, are you going to use these kind of models and, and, and use median splits or whatever? Good on the question. 
and how do different heuristics compare across different environments? The last question is really interesting. How do different heuristics compare across different environments? The bottom line is the following. And this is my conclusion, which I never dared publish. I don't think they vary that much. <laughs> Basically, as you actually, uh, ha if you have the right variables in the model, the different heuristics do actually a fairly common job. It, it turns out there are some restrict some, some, some little differences, but let me explain to you some of the little differences. One, first, more models perform better as the environment becomes more predictable, BGO. Okay? At the same time, differences in model performance grow larger. Okay? Second, relative model performance depends on both how the environment weighs cues, non-compensatory, compensatory, or equal weighting, and redundancy. Redundancy is important. That we came up with in one of the talks this morning. Third, we find that when cues are ordered correctly, take the best performs best in non-compensatory environments when redundancy is low. Single variable performs best in non-compensatory environments when redundancy is high. Irrespective of redundancy, equal weight performs best in equal weighting environments in which Conf also produces performs well. Conf was a model in Italia invented. Conf was basically once you've got through it, you take the best kind of model, you've got your take the best alternative, you come to the choice, check your choice with one more variable and see whether you have confidence in it. And that, that was sort of like a hedging, a hedging strategy. It, 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 it does quite well, but not as well as take the best by itself. Uh, EW and sometimes take the best performs best in compensatory environments where redundancy is low. And finally, take the best and sometimes single variable performs best in compensatory environments when redundancy is high. What we tried to do in that paper was actually run these models through a whole bunch of tasks and then afterwards recover where and when they were predicted well or badly and why and what the conditions were. Now, uh, I had thought that the talk was, it was over there, but there's actually one more thought I have. I hope. How do we convince people of our results? Well, I don't want to die. <laughs> Neither do you do it. It's too much fun. Not you, the others. Yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the others. That's, yeah, the others, yeah, exactly. Okay, well, 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 we mustn't go around sticking pins in people, right? In dolls. Voodoo, the voodoo approach. Uh, recently, I've been exploring with my uh, colleague and uh, former student, Emery Rosario, the notion of actually having people learn through experiencing the distributions. And the idea, what we find is, in a nutshell, is that people can actually make quite good, quote unquote, probability predictions and calculations if you get, present data to them in the form of simulations involving natural frequencies. It's the way, way I, I would tie my work to think. So I think that one of the things one could do is actually, when you've got these results, don't present the results as such, but allow people to simulate and see the results and see what happens. In fact, I would argue that oftentimes when you actually want to present results, say to a, a forecasting, to a manager, if you're a forecaster, don't present the forecasts. Allow the manager, present the person with a regression model hidden in, in a simulation, and let the person simulate out and see what happens. So one of the things we're playing around with right now is the notion of whether we can get people to learn better from using simulation data, because we think that's important, because what's important is experience. Uh, unless you experience the things, it's not just decisions from experience, but from experience in the sense of, basically, if I experience the data, I will feel more about it and I'll trust it more. Because I think if I give a, man give a manager a prediction with a mean of x and a standard deviation of, of x plus 6, whatever it is, they're not going to understand it. If they've played with the distribution, they can do, do quite well. And there's some people who have also been using this kind of technique in things like uh, choosing optimal portfol portfolios for investment and so on and so forth. Okay, that's all I wanted to say except for questions I may have. Okay.